All right, it is being recorded now. Okay. Um, probably everybody knows this, but a new town council has been elected. And at least tentatively, uh, Evan Ross may no longer be a town councilor, although he lost by three votes. I don't know whether there's a, a recount or anything that might be involved there since it's only three votes. But George Ryan definitely lost by a larger margin. And Alyssa Brewer and Sarah Schwartz both, both did not uh, pursue continuing. And I count them all as advocates for affordable housing. So hopefully others will take their place uh, since we always need advocates for affordable housing. Uh, let's see. The second thing I wanted to mention, and I actually sent people a copy of this, uh, there was a legislative hearing on the transfer fee. The transfer fee, if you recall, is essentially um, something that localities or towns could elect uh, to implement, and it would be a transfer fee of a certain percentage to be decided by the town that would be applied to higher end real estate transactions. Uh, so that's, uh, that's before the legislature and uh, people from Somerville primarily, but elsewhere are organizing to uh, try to push that through the legislature. Um, it's been around for at least two years before this. So it's uncertain exactly what its future will be, but hopefully it get passed, I think in a, the town council and also the housing trust had endorsed earlier versions of it. So I felt comfortable um, offering testimony in support. And uh, the third thing that I wanted to mention is I was on a call that Pamela Schwartz organizes. She's uh, the, coordinator or executive director of affordable housing in the Pioneer Valley. It's a basically Hampshire, Hamden, Franklin and Berkshire counties. Anyway, there was a report there that said that the number of requests for funds for people who threatened by eviction are increasing statewide. And I think those are requests for raft and uh, also Irma funds. Um, there was no data offered for Western Massachusetts, although I'd be surprised if it wasn't an issue for us here as well. Uh, so those are the three announcements I wanted to make. Uh, let's see. I got a note from uh, um, from Linda Slakey saying that she's attending, just so people know, Laura Baker's also in attendance, as is Nina Weil, and Linda seemed to think that Pam Rooney might be joining us as well. So we're still waiting for a quorum. Uh, let's see. Um, we can't really review minutes until we have a quorum because we have to agree to those. Uh, and then beyond that, the next item has to do with ARPA funding, which I won't go into until we have a quorum since it's an important issue and there are a number of votes we need to take there. Uh, just to review the rest of the agenda, as Nate mentioned earlier, we'll be looking at the housing authority proposal to replace what is called the building envelope for the it's John Nutting building. Um, and we'll also do a quick review of the trust proposals and the town of Amherst proposals and decide whether we wanna send a letter off to the Community Preservation Act Committee endorsing those. Um, <clears throat> see, we don't necessarily need a quorum for this. Uh, Lucia and I did a draft proposal for Hickory Ridge. It's intended to be a first draft with the expectation that um, we will have comments and we'll probably go through 
uh, potentially one or two other drafts on that um, before we go forward with something that we want to formally propose to the town. So uh, I guess I could skip down to that item and see if people had a chance to look at that draft and if there are comments on it. I know there's a lot of homework this week. <laughs> so if people didn't get a chance, I certainly understand. But if anybody does have comments related to that, um, obviously we'll be interested. I looked at it, but I can't say that I <clears throat> thought, wow, they did a lot of work. This looks good. That was kind of my, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, uh, thanks, Carol. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, yeah, there's still things left to do. I noticed Dave Zomek is on the call, and I know Dave had some reservations about my distributing it. Um, but let me see if Dave, Dave had any comments on the proposal or the draft. Uh, thanks, John. Yeah, I too have had kind of a busy week and, and didn't have a whole lot of time to review it. I did, I did read through it. Um, you know, nothing really jumped out at me. I appreciate, uh, you and others, um, kind of getting, getting on top of this. You know, our, our planning process for Hickory jump started with our three public events a couple of weeks ago on a Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, and we had over 230 people there. Um, and again, I, I think it's early. We don't own the property yet. We hope to close in the next 45 to 60 days. So I think any input from the trust for staff would be great. Um, I do know I'm meeting with staff uh, next week, I believe, Nate. We right. have a, a planning staff meeting on Hickory. Um, so yeah, we we would kind of take under advisement any um, any recommendations that the trust has uh, with regard to the to, to the use of the property. I think John, your your proposal does call out that um, we don't know a lot because we haven't we don't own it and we haven't spent a lot of time or or any money on further investigating the developable land. So um, that will, you know, how much land is is developable there will be will be you know critical to some of the decisions we make down the road. So any recommendations the trust have would be great. I think I will ask uh, Nate and Rob Mora and Chris Brestrup and others to kind of come up with some scenarios and and uh, they may be informed by what the trust recommends. So we appreciate. Yeah. Well, we're not recommending anything yet, of course. Um, but it does strike me that one of the issues that's raised in the draft is whether we would ha have a development or recommend a development that would be all older adults, whether it would be mixed for any age. And uh, I think as I thought about it, as we were writing this up, it struck me that uh, it would be harder to do a multi-age development if we only had five acres. If there's nine acres to play with there, then I think that's a little bit more likely. But it's hard for me to see how uh, we would have uh, enough property to have places for kids to have the kind of play equipment and other things that you'd want in a development that was for families if we only had five acres. So yeah. I'd be curious to see what you and, and your staff also think about that issue, Dave. Mm -hmm. No, it's a great, great question, John. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I don't want to speculate at this point. Um, I would be very surprised if there's nine contiguous acres there that are developable. The, the frontage on, and, and for those of you who haven't seen some of the maps of Hickory, um, uh, the land along West Pelham, uh, West Pelham, West Pomeroy Lane um, um, is very, it's narrow. It's not a, it's not a, I guess it's a long, narrow rectangle, you might say. Uh, it is not a square. It is, um, it has got some intermittent streams and some wetlands. So, so yeah, we, we haven't done due diligence on that to look at setbacks and stream protection and whatnot. 
And then, of course, you know, I'm sure some of you have weighed in on Engage Amherst uh, Hickory, and I know there's been a lot of uh, support there for affordable housing on the site. Um, and we also have to think, what are the compatible, what are the other compatible uses on the frontage uh, that is developable? So we'll want to retain some areas for parking, for public parking, public access, uh, those kinds of things. But it's it's a great opportunity. Uh, as I've said before, I think I've been working on the project, I think, for over four years. And um, we're getting near the finish line, which at least is to own the property. And now I guess the hard work begins, which is to kind of create a vision for what we want the property to look like moving forward. So we look forward to your uh, your input and recommendations in the months ahead. Great, great. Um, I notice Erica and Sid have joined us. Um, before we leave this topic, which I picked up because we really didn't need a quorum to talk about it, do either of you have any comments on the draft about the potential uses of Hickory Ridge for affordable housing? No, I I've see liked, Sid. I was gonna say, I've liked all of the ones that have to do with affordable housing on, um, on the website. And I was also very happily surprised to see how many people really thought affordable housing was a really important, um, uh, that would be an opportunity to, to create that there. Okay, thank you. I saw your chat message. So if you need to leave now. <laughs> uh, no, I, I left my husband at, at his family's house and said I had to go to this meeting. So <laughs> I may be the odd one out in the family, but it is what it is. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for doing that, Erica. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the beginning, more or less, of the agenda. Um, I did kind of briefly go over the few announcements about the changes in town council, testimony supporting uh, the transfer fee and the fact that eviction support requests seem to be increasing statewide. So our, our next issue is to review the minutes from the October meeting. And as usual, if there are comments on those, then we can make changes. If not, then uh, we assume that the minutes are accepted as uh, presented. Carol, you almost always have comments on minutes. <laughs> I, re I read them, but no, I, I didn't have any. I don't know. They look good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, then, uh, let's see. I think we should move on to the question of ARPA funding, since it's a big issue. And uh, and there are a fair number of things for us to discuss. And as I said, we, we do now have a, a good quorum. So that's great. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, the state funding picture is still a bit uncertain. The House passed recommendations totaling $600 million. The Senate Ways and Means have made recommendations totaling $600 million. Uh, for those who don't know, the governor had originally proposed a billion dollars in ARPA funds. Uh, so the House and Senate are on a path to uh, have $400 million less than what the governor had planned or proposed for the ARPA budget, which is a bit disappointing. Although the sense that I get from advocates, the few advocates that I talk to is uh, they're all feeling pretty good about the 600 million. I'm not sure I feel that good about it, but that's what they feel. <laughs> I, I'd like to have the other 400 million. Uh, let's see. Uh, both of the Senate and the House budgets do have money for uh, creating permanent supported housing. Uh, for some for home ownership assistance, some for production and preservation of affordable housing, and some for public housing maintenance, which is interesting. Uh, so we won't know where they are until we have Senate action and whether that's going to be agreeable to the governor or not. I also want to note that at the federal level, 
there is something like $5 billion in ARPA funds available through the HOME program. I have to confess that I'm not familiar with the HOME program. You may be, Nate, so maybe you can explain better than I can what it is, but it will support a variety of different housing initiatives. Most of the money in the HOME program seems to go directly to states, but some of it also goes to local governments. So I guess I have a couple of questions, Nate. Oh, first of all, are we getting any of the uh, ARPA money that's targeted to the HOME program for local governments? And if so, what can we do with it beyond the <clears throat> other ARPA money that we have? I'm not aware that we are. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, you know Amherst um, receives its block grant money through the state you know, we're a mini entitlement, so we get money administered uh, through the state. So we don't get uh, HUD funding directly from the federal government. So, you know, my thought is uh, we, we won't be getting the home money either directly from HUD or the federal government. So it would have to be through the state or sometimes, you know, regional um, agencies have money that could be, you know, we could work with them, but. Okay, so there's no expectation that we would get that money directly. Right. Anything we'll get would become likely through the state or maybe through, uh, I guess, Wayfinders, which is the regional agency that administers some of the state housing funds. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, nonetheless, it looks like the state is going to have a lot of money. Some of it is what the legislature is currently appropriating. And I'm su assuming that DHCD would get additional funds through the home program, which could have a variety of uses. Uh, theoretically, those funds were allocated back in September. Uh, although again, I really don't know any of the details. Um, I think all I wanna say is for the kinds of projects that we have in mind for our local ARP funds, it looks like those same kinds of initiatives should be eligible for state ARPA funds. Does that make sense to you, Nate? It does. And um, I'm just making a note to myself to research it a little bit more too, just to, um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, I know, um, I know the town manager's office and other town officials I've met with, you know, some state officials. And so I think there may be, right, some other ARPA and home funds available for the town um, I don't know how, you know, I, there hasn't been a formal application process announced or anything, so I'm not sure exactly how you go about requesting it, but um, I know there's money <laughs> there. <laughs> it's murky. It is. It is a little bit. I, even the town ARPA funds is a little, um, you know, I feel like they're trying to make it easy, but it's almost like we're so used to regulation that we don't know how to accept money easily, you know, like what it's like, what are the strings attached? What are, how do you go about it? And so I feel like um, it's just, it's a strange when they allocate funding without a lot of guidance. And so, um, you know, Sean Mangano, the finance director is really working in terms of the town's ARPA funding, but it, it is, it's an odd, odd way. Um, it seems like how the money's getting out. Okay, well, then I think we'll turn our attention to the four ARPA pro proposals that we have before us. And we'll start with the biggest one. But before we do that, I just want to say that for each proposal, I think we need to decide three things. First, whether we do want to recommend it to Sean Mangano or to Town Hall. Um, second, before it goes over, are there any changes we want to make in the drafts that you all have seen? And third, how much money do we want to recommend for each of the individual proposals? So um, without any further conversation on uh, that. John, I just I want to say, Laura, Laura wrote in the chat that, you know, DHCD often disperses home funds, um, you know, and then um, she said it is treated like soft debt, um, but it is federal, so it triggers prevailing wage. And sometimes it has different rent caps or, you know, income limits. So there is, you know, typically right home funds have their own set of regulations that are, would be, um, would have to be followed even if it is ARPA funding. Um, okay. 
Thanks for that, Laura. Um, which means we still don't really know, you know what we'll get in the access to ARPA funds or what we'll be able to do with it. Mm -hmm. So the first proposal that was on our agenda was one that Allegra put together. And I, I do want to say for each of the proposals, as they're introduced, I'd like people to say who they talk to in preparing the proposal particularly for people who are not part of the housing trust. I just want the record to be clear that uh, maybe all of us talk to somebody outside of the housing trust to get some advice on preparing the proposal. And I think we wanna be transparent about that, at least among ourselves. So I think Allegra is the first up and uh, <laughs> maybe, Nate, could you share that proposal on the screen so everybody can see it, if you don't mind? It's the permanent or permanent location for a shelter. Yes. yes. Um, okay, I, I have just the one with the markup version, if that's all right, John. You, you had provided a few comments. Oh, well, that's okay. All right. Yeah, comments I provided to Allegra. I guess that's okay, because I'd say them anyway if they uh, weren't apparent, and Allegra's certainly aware of them. Yeah, right. If, so Allegra, that, do you want to talk about that? Is that visible for everyone? Is everyone good? Allegra, if you need to turn your video off, even though you're speaking, just because I know you said you were dropping off a little bit. Let me try that. Um, so I did speak with Kevin Noonan primarily over at Craig's Doors. I also spoke with a few members of the board of directors and there was an email with the housing, oh my God, the show, the special um, force working group that we were on. And right now I can't remember the acronym, I'm sorry. There's so many things well, in my brain. Um, and in speaking with Kevin, although my original kind of assignment was to think about both either a proposal for a permanent location for the shelter and also the purchase of University Motor Lodge. It seemed like the purchase of University Motor Lodge both for financial reasons and for some um, negotiation reasons probably wasn't gonna be feasible at this point. Um, so we did kind of focus on the idea of a permanent location for emergency shelter. Um, and there was a possibility identified that the board of Craig's Doors had toured and some members I believe from the town had toured separately. And there were conversations about whether that could be converted into either a shelter or possibly some sort of permanent supported housing program. Um, and so in terms of the shelter, there, you know, they do have the University Motor Lodge operating through January or excuse me, June of next year. And the congregate shelter did just open yesterday at its seasonal location, from my understanding. Um, and there, there are some concerns about how how that will operate. Um, and why they would still want to find a permanent location for the shelter. Um, so they did kind of say that although they, the congregate, uh, the non congregate, the hotel model has seemed to be more successful, especially in getting people housed from there, um, the option that we have identified for now wouldn't necessarily be feasible. So they would still like to focus on trying to find a permanent place to be. Um, and so some of the numbers in terms of capacity that were provided were provided from a report that I believe an intern had been doing. Um, so it looked like about 40 guests was what the congregate capacity should be. Um, and I believe there are about 28 to 30 people at University Motor Lodge at this point, but those rooms are basically offline because it is, it, they're, that's the room that they're staying in is my understanding of how it's operating. So 
it's not like those are, are spaces where people can come every night and try and get a space there was my understanding. Um, and so in terms of what the money would actually go towards, it would be towards purchasing a property um, that seems to be in relatively good shape with a commercial kitchen, pretty large square footage. Um, it would not have any of the operating costs in terms of services provided included in that number. Um, so that's, that's kind of questions for Allegra. No, I mean, I think, you know, um, just to reiterate, you know, when we spoke with ARPA about ARPA funding and Sean presented it, you know, I think they're, you know, they're presenting uh, the town staff is going to present it to the council. Um, they need to uh, approve it or make a recommendation on the plan, um, I think early by early next month. And, you know, they have about a million dollars uh, set aside for, for homelessness and other money for housing. And I think, you know, at this point, the idea is to keep the recommendations broad uh, for the council vote, just so that we're not, you know, having one, uh, you know, one housing piece for a million dollars. So I think the idea would be that the housing trust recommendations would be would be used to help guide how that money is is allocated. Um, but I don't think the council is going to vote anything specific. So even if, for instance, the trust vote at all has put nine hundred fifty thousand towards the purchase of a property, the council may not be that specific in their vote, just so that there's some flexibility in the funding. Um, you know, just so we're not, just so, you know, we're not, you know, we're clear on the process. Um, yeah, I have two comments on this. Um, one is my sense is that, well, first of all, in, in the material that Sean gave us, there were really two ideas for what should be done to address homelessness. Uh, finding a permanent location for the seasonal shelter was one, which is represented here. And the second was developing a transitional residential program, um, place unspecified. And in addition to that being present in the uh, ARPA presentation for town council last month, um, the town has also asked the Community Preservation Act Committee for half a million dollars for support of a transitional residential programs. So it seems to me that both of those ideas are competing for this program. And the second comment I'll make is that uh, personally, I keep going back and forth whether we should do or support a transitional residential program or support money for a permanent shelter. Generally, I kind of like the idea of a transitional residential program because I think that's necessary. I think the success of the UML program demonstrates that. And so from that point of view, that would be the way to go. My only hesitancy about this is this may be the last best opportunity of the town to find money for a permanent uh, seasonal shelter program or a permanent shelter. Uh, and the Emanuel Lutheran Church, which is where the seasonal shelter is beginning, I guess, yesterday or today, is the third church location for that shelter in the last three years. So it hasn't been easy for Craig's Doors to find a place. And there's no reason to think it will continue to get any easier. Maybe they'll go back to Emmanuel Luther and next year, maybe another church will step forward or maybe there'll be no location. So I have a vague feeling, well, it's more than a vague feeling that if a, uh, a, an actual seasonal shelter location isn't found in the near future, Amherst may no longer have a seasonal shelter within the next one to two years. And so I'm not really eager for the money to be spent this way. On the other hand, I, I don't think the need for congregate shelter is going to go away. And if Amherst doesn't have a congregate shelter, 
then that's a significant loss uh, to the shelter system in the Pioneer Valley. So that's the one reason I would have for supporting the program as Allegra has described it. So now I'll stop what I have to say and ask other people what they think. Can I ask you a question, John? Could you say sure. a little bit more about why you feel that this and the other one are in competition? Well, yes. Um, if you have a transitional residential program, that's likely to be eligible for funding from DHCD. If the town takes some of its ARPA money and takes money from the Community Preservation Act, um, then that's fine. It means that the likelihood of creating the transitional residential program is pretty good. On the other hand, if the ARPA money and the CPAC money can't go to shelter. So if the ARPA money doesn't go to the shelter, then where is it going to come from at some point in the future? And so it's in that sense that I see that there's a competition that the town is going to have to choose whether to use its ARPA money for the transitional residential program, which makes good sense, or whether it's going to say, this is our last best chance to find a secure, stable location for our homeless shelter, and let's use the money for that. Does that so answer your question, Carol? Partly that seems to turn on the fact that CPAC can't be used to fund this. That's right. That, that's what makes this thing a one-time opportunity. Yeah. The other yeah, okay, thing. Okay. Thank you. I'm. I, I I didn't mention before, which I should <clears> mention. <throat> Allegra may not be aware of it, but I talked to Jerry Weiss. He gave me a call. I think it was earlier today, although I've lost track. Um, there's been some conversation about this with, uh, and I'm blocking on his last name, Gordy so and so at DHCD. And he told Jerry, if the town wants to put up money for a shelter, DHC would probably find additional money to support this development because they think it is important for the town to continue to have a congregate shelter. So there's a chance of getting additional money from DHCD uh, for going forward with this. But I think the town has to put some money in in order to make that happen. So that's my understanding. I don't know if anybody else has other information or additional information beyond what I've just said. Uh, I guess going back to me for a second, because I, I tend to agree philosophically with you, John, is that I would prefer to have like permanent supported housing for people than a congregate shelter personally, because I think that's moving more towards housing than it is, you know, and stability. Um, I believe I read something recently that was there was going to be some introduction of some legislation that was actually moving away from providing congregate shelter and moving towards more of like the motel sheltering model. Um, so I guess I don't know. I mean, I don't know where it is in the stage of things, but if, if the, be a moot point at this point, or if this is still something to follow through with. And I just, I also just think like knowing what building at least they, you know, I'm conceptualizing in this, um, it seems like it could have the opportunity to be redeveloped into a more, you know, there, there are multiple large spaces within the building that possibly could be parceled out in different ways. I don't, I don't know. Um, and again, so it I know could be temporarily a congregate shelter, and then after a few years, if congregate shelters go away, the building is flexible enough so that it could be converted into some form of permanent uh, supported housing, if I understand you correctly. That's kind of how I see it and envision it, just having seen at least pictures of the space and having been in it previously as a previous establishment in town. But Yeah. I'll mention one other thing, which is consistent with what you've said. There was also a conversation about this idea that congregate shelters might be going away 
at the um, Pioneer Valley, uh, whatever it is for homelessness that Pamela Schwartz runs this morning. And everybody seemed to agree that in principle, we'd be much better off if we could do uh, transitional housing programs like the University Motor Lodge rather than congregate sheltering. The problem is those transitional programs cost much more uh, per unit. And so nobody knew where the additional money would come from, which sort of suggested that congregate shelters would still be with us for a while. So, uh, I hope I've said everything that I have to say about the proposal that the leg were brought before us. Um, any looks other like, comments? Looks like Dave has his hand up. Great. Uh, thanks, John. Um, no, this has been a this has been a great conversation. Um, I think a lot of very good points raised, and and to me, you know, as I've listened to everybody, it it really you know, kind of represents this conundrum. And John, I, I think uh, you and you and Allegra kind of, you know, captured it, which is which is we all would like to move away. I mean, the data and, and the research and the outcomes really suggest um, that that we need to move away from congregate shelters. Uh, the experiences we've had across the state and probably across the region during the during the pandemic of using hotels and motels uh suggest um exactly that and in fact uh, john i was on that call with john this morning and right and kevin noonan you know really was was quite effusive in in describing how positive using the university motor lodge was so we were, were kind of faced with this conundrum of what do we do you know are we are we continuing with you know the band-aid which is a necessary band-aid which is keeping people safe and and alive during the cold new england winter or do we begin to put more resources toward you know permanent supportive housing and i always struggle too I, I, personally i think professionally when when people say we need a permanent shelter in amherst and this just might be a a permanent congregate shelter in amherst and it might just be a a thing that i'm stuck on and and Boy, I hope we don't need a permanent congregate shelter in Amherst. I really hope we don't. I, I hope we we, we take no. every we make every effort to to make sure that doesn't happen. We need to. So, but I guess in 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 closing, my one concern, and and I think Nate alluded to it here, is that if the trust does make a um, a recommendation to um, to um, uh, the council with regard to the um, ARPA funds. I would I would definitely not link it to one property. Um, I think that's um, uh, uh, just not a good good way to move forward. I think uh, I would I would leave it broad um, because there's a lot that can happen with real estate. I, I know that uh, there's Laura Baker is on this call and Laura has looked at real estate in Amherst for many years as I have, as Nate have, as many of you have. So. I think the danger is is putting all your eggs in one basket. So um, there's we may not move forward on on a, a property that's being looked at right now. I, I think I would I would recommend you keep it broad um, to look for a site for a shelter that might be versatile enough that someday could be converted to or redeveloped into supportive uh, permanent supportive housing, something like that. So those, those are my recommendations and thoughts. Thanks. Yeah, I, I have just one other comment, Dave. Um, I agree with you. I wouldn't like to see a permanent shelter in Amherst. On the other hand, I'm reminded of a conversation I had 35 years ago. I was newly <laughs> working as director of planning for the New York State Office of Mental Health. And a friend of mine, Joe Morrissey, who's a sociologist, um, who I'd known for a number of years was there at the time. And I said, Joe, when's this homeless problem going to start to abate or disappear? And he looked at me, he said, are you kidding? It's not going away. Um, the way society is set up, there are structural constraints 
that will mean that we continue to have a homelessness problem in the society. Now, we were mostly talking about big cities like New York City at the time, but I think it also applies to Western Massachusetts and Amherst. So the problem isn't going away anytime soon. That's a conversation I said that I had 35 years ago. Yeah, I absolutely <laughs> agree, John, and I'm, I'm not saying it is going to go away, but I do think there's an argument to be made that if we look at the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we've put into um, sheltering over the last 10 years in Amherst, if we look at that data and we say, well, how much money have we put into permanent supportive housing? I think that'll be a pretty stark comparison. So we're, we're not, we're not meeting the housing need. And I think, um, again, uh, kudos to Valley CDC for the work they're doing with 132 Northampton Road in providing some units there that will be uh, in that category. But I just don't think we've done enough. We, 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 have, not, we have not moved in that direction. And I know that um, Mary Beth Ogilevitz, before she left, was working on this with Allegra and other folks and really trying to trying to, to wrestle with that conundrum of how do we how do we flip this dynamic a little bit and say let's produce more housing let's let's move toward that model of of converting say the UML to um, to um, um, permanent supportive housing something like that and I know there's challenges with the UML I'm just I guess I'm advocating for both that we need the we need the short-term congregate housing but boy we've got to move toward the permanent supportive housing too. We we just we can no longer just um, do what we've been doing for ten years. So thanks. Okay, well let me come back to everybody, uh, particularly Allegra. What would you like to do with this proposal? Do you want to send it on to uh, Sean Mangano as it is, or uh, do you want to modify it in some way and then send it along? I mean, I kind of like the phrasing that Dave just gave about kind of, you know, we have this temporary need for, you know, a safe place for people to be, but we also have this longer term need. So if there was a location that we could find that could possibly serve in the short term as congregate and in the longer term, perhaps, you know, be more supportive housing that's permanent for people that would i mean that would be my ideal i think that would be that would be where i would feel good about it i guess um okay thanks <laughs> yeah my thought john is you know for each proposal if we if the trust votes it my thought is um you know you and i and lucia after could maybe write just a summary paragraph or extract something from each document and you know so what it would be it could be you know a one a one document sent to Sean that has, you know, say five paragraphs and each paragraph or paragraph or two is describing the, rec the separate recommendations. You know, I spoke with him and he said, at this point, we don't need to have, you know, pages upon pages. Um, so I think if we just had a summary of, um, of what we discussed here, if we think, you know, uh, you know, in terms of, we, if we say, you know, whether we call it sheltering or transitional housing, but we have then a, a summary paragraph or two I think that would be sufficient for now. Uh, I don't think we have to have as much detail as you know, a, you know, a budget or financing or possible partners or anything. I think it's really just a summary of, of kind of the program. You know, I think that would be easier too. I you know if, if that's if as opposed to having someone rework this to make it kind of a formal proposal. I think just a you know. Okay, so let me go. Are we all comfortable with submitting a proposal? that's along the lines of what Allegra just dis described. Can that I just is... clarify too, there are two separate slides on the slide deck that Sean had shown us, correct? And one was specific to housing and one was specific to homeless and, and supportive. There were two separate line items, so to speak. Am I right in thinking that? Yes, you're right. But the yeah. homeless one included uh, the transitional residential program. So I guess what I'm saying is, in other words, none of the other proposals that we are talking about tonight would fall under that category. They would possibly fall under the housing category. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, no, I, yeah, I agree too. I, I think that this, if we recommend this, this would go under the, the homelessness category, you know, slice of the pie that Sean had presented. I guess the only thing I would say is I kind of agreed with Dave that it should be, it makes sense to make it really clear that there's one possibility of a property, but not to tie the whole thing to a particular property. I agree. Okay. Well, is everybody comfortable then with um, sending a proposal to Sean for either a permanent location for emergency shelter or a transitional residential program or some combination if that becomes possible? That I think is what we're moving toward. because I'm about to ask for a vote. So uh, Okay, I, I guess I'm going to make a motion then that we change this proposal so that it reflects either a permanent location for emergency shelter or a transitional residential program or some combination of the two to the extent that that's possible. Is there a second to that motion? Was the motion unclear? Yeah, can you repeat it again? Yes. And Allegra, tell me if this is not consistent with what you were saying, that we would propose either a permanent location for emergency shelter or a transitional residential program or um, some combination of the two to the extent that that's possible. Do you want to modify that in any way, Allegra? I don't think so. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Second. Okay, so Rob seconded. Are we ready to take a vote? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, then uh, let's see. I'll start with Sid. Yes. Allegra? Yes. Erica? Yes. Uh, Rob? Yes. And I'm a yes. And Carol? Yes. Okay, so it's six to zero in favor of that recommendation. Okay, great. Then we'll move on to the next proposal, which is the one I think that I've offered, which is to put roughly $400,000 to a program that would approve the health efficiency and so forth of, uh, the heating systems in affordable housing. Yes, housing that is more affordable, healthier, climate resilient, and fossil fuel fee. Thank you, Nate. Okay, I've talked about this in the past, so I'm not going to go over it unless somebody has specific questions. Are there questions? I'm gonna say one other thing about this, but it also applies to the three other proposals that we have before us, or two other proposals that we have before us. And that is that personally, I would like to see the town include all of them uh, in its recommendations to town council for the simple reason that I think we should get our foot in the door with each of these initiatives so that when the time comes, and I think the time will come, when we have an opportunity to apply for state ARPA funds, or perhaps federal funds or whatever, um, if we have created a bit of a record in each of these areas, then we'll be able to expand the program. 
Yeah, John, I, I know you attended um, a seminar on this or a workshop and have, has there been any follow-up in terms of implementation? Because I do think that this is one of a kind of a more complex program that we're looking at in terms of, you know, how does it uh, benefit the tenant? Um, you know, how do we, you know, um, and we talked about like, does the landlord have to, property owner need to sign a type of deed restriction or, a, you know, a, some type of, you know, note or something. And, you know, how do we make sure that the benefit is to the tenant, not, you know, not, necess not necessarily only the property owner, right? Um, yep. Um, actually, I, I forgot to say one other thing and then I'll answer your question, Nate. Sure. Um, I did consult with Laura Drucker, who's the chair of the ECAC and with, Stephanie Ciccarello, who's the town sustainability or officer on the preparation of this proposal. Um, to answer your question, if you look down, um, one of the things that I lost, uh, learned in the uh, webinar that I attended, which is referenced in this, is that the town of Chelsea and possibly one or two other towns have already begun implementing this kind of program. And if people may not know, the town of Chelsea was particularly hard hit by COVID-19 and health problems because of the density of housing in that community. And so there is a model, if you like, for how to go about this. Um, and what's interesting is that part of it had to do with relationships with landlords and getting them to accept the program, but part of it also had to do with outreach to tenants as well. Um, basically, tenants need to be on board with this. And that's something that actually uh, um, both Stephanie and Laura are concerned about, and they've already initiated work on a program uh, of tenant outreach, or what they hope will be a program for tenant outreach through um, Amherst Family Outreach. Um, so part of it is working with landlords, which is something we can expect from um, the Center for Eco-Technology to do. That's something that they currently are doing. And part of it is working with tenants. And uh, the reason why tenants are important is because they either have to say to landlords, I really want this, or in fact, in some cases, it's the other way around. That is, tenants can say, I want this in my unit and get the landlord's permission to do it, but the tenants themselves would benefit directly because they pay the freight for heating costs. Uh, and again, that's been part of the Chelsea program. So yeah, there are program models, at least in Chelsea. I can't tell you where else, but my impression is that there are at least one or two other Massachusetts towns who have been, who started up this kind of program. So we're not entirely working in the dark. Other questions? Okay, well, I think we need to come to a vote then so we can move on to the next proposal. And uh, uh, I move that we recommend this program uh, at a level of $400,000 to Sean Mangano for inclusion in the town's ARPA spending plan. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Can I ask a question? Can I ask a, maybe it's a clarifying question. Absolutely. Where, are, where are we in the, like, Nate made a suggestion that instead of sending all of these whole things forward that we make it into a paragraph, a paragraph four or however many paragraphs so when we're voting on these, are we? What does the vote we're taking have to do with that suggestion? I'm not quite sure whether I'm, by saying yes, am I voting that I think that's a bad idea because I don't know that yet. I mean, so I'm just a little, not clear about that part. Did the question make sense? <laughs> the question kind of made sense. I think what we're <laughs> voting on is the one-page proposal. 
we, we may eventually decide with each of these proposals to um, reduce the size and package them in something that more may be more digestible for Sean. Um, but I think the first thing for us to vote on is whether we're in favor of moving ahead with this kind of program recommendation. Okay, so the so the vote is really on the kind this program as described here, even though the way it gets described when it goes forward may be slightly different than this. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody comfortable with that? <clears throat> okay. So Sid seconded it. So now we're at the point of uh, uh, taking a vote. And uh, let's see. Um, okay, I'll start out with Rob. Yes. Uh, I'm a yes. Carol. Yes. Erica. Yes. Sid. Yes. Allegra. Yes. Okay, so I think that's six votes in favor. And basically, that's everybody we have because uh, Paul and Will aren't here and we don't have a ninth member. Okay, moving on to the next proposal. Uh, the next proposal is probably the one about developing subsidies for home ownership programs where we purchase uh, property for a homeowner that would be existing property as opposed to development. And um, I, Rob and, and Erica developed that proposal. Yep, I, I can speak to it. Um, so this this um, proposal is based on, on the experience of the Amherst Community Land Trust running uh, a, a similar program or, or identical program that is ongoing right now. It has it has already um, connected one new home buyer with a, with a new home, and we're hoping for a second one soon. Um, I'm a member of I'm a, a board member of the Amherst Community Land Trust, so so this is based on on you know several years of of developing the program and, and trying to implement the program. Um, we we work with uh, Valley. Community development. To, to, um, they provide our uh, technical assistance. They do the outreach. They help us do the outreach. Uh, they, they help us on intake for uh, applicants for homes. They they uh, run the lottery that that selects the people who will actually be able to take these um, uh, subsidies and go out and find a home. So uh, there's no way that we could have done it without without uh, Valley. And, and so the problem is that um, homes in Amherst are just, are just too expensive for someone who is a low-income person to buy into. Um, a low-income person can, can buy according to the calculations if you, if you take only 30% of your income towards housing, can only afford to buy something in the range of $250,000 home. And there just aren't that many homes on the market at $250,000 in Amherst. There's, there's a few a year. And, and the competition for those homes is fierce. And it's not just from um, permanent resident potential home buyers, it's, it's from uh, entrepreneurs looking to uh, acquire student housing and it's for and it's also uh, from people who are looking for a home that's out of the city um new york boston they, they're, they're coming to amherst and there's just a lot of competition and those and those other um competitors are often able to uh outbid or uh, not often almost always are able to outbid um in terms of amount that they can bring and how quickly they can they can bring uh, financing to the table to, to acquire these homes. So, so the Amherst Community Land Trust program is is proposing to um, guarantee a certain amount of of uh, subsidy towards the purchase of a home. 
that that so 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 that a home buyer is able to bring is able to just bring the amount that they would need to get a two hundred fifty thousand dollar home. But if you add the subsidy that that is being offered, they can actually compete for homes in the three hundred fifty or possibly even four hundred thousand dollar range, which is which is the actual median for Amherst. So it, it opens up a, a, a more homes that could become affordable. The difference between uh, this program and a, uh, I think this is my, this was an old version of, of, of the uh, proposal that I had. There's, there's another, there's an updated version that is more clear. <laughs> it doesn't have some of this extraneous stuff. Anyway, um, yeah, that's all that stuff. Forget that. All right. Um, our model is that the home becomes permanently affordable. Um, subsidy that we that would be brought to to the purchase of the home would would stay in the home permanently. It would it would remove the land from the market and leaving just the home on the market. The home would be owned by the homeowner. They would have all the rights and, and responsibilities of home ownership. And, um, but our agreement with the homeowner would be that when the home goes back on the market, it's, it goes back on the market at a, an affordable price, the same level that uh, the home buyer acquired it. So, so this, is a, this is a permanent program. This, 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 home, this makes homes Permanently affordable. It's a great program, um, and it's very expensive. Um, unquestionably, the the amount of subsidy that is needed in order to make a home affordable for a low income person in Amherst is well over a hundred thousand dollars, approaching two hundred thousand dollars for each home, and so um, that would be the ask. Um, how many homes are we are we willing and able to to make affordable? Okay, questions for Rob or comments? Okay, I have only one comment, which I think Rob is at least aware of. And my only concern is that um, this proposal only identifies the Amherst Community Land Trust. Uh, Valley Community Development and Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity both also have home ownership programs. They work somewhat similarly, although there are some, what I would describe as relatively minor differences between their programs and this program. Um, this program is probably the most generous in the sense that uh, it allocates the most money to assisting with home purchase, but the others also rely on a, a fair amount of money in order to subsidize the purchase of home ownership for existing real estate in Amherst. And so I'm a little uncomfortable with their being left out. And I also don't think it's appropriate to see the housing trust as a purchaser of this property or a holder of this property, because that's something that we're not set up to do. So those are my two comments. Other than that, um, I, I like the proposal and I think that we should support it. Can I respond to that? Sure. So um, yeah, I, I completely agree. The, uh, what Valley does, what, what Habitat does, those are also extremely important and valuable. Um, and, I, and I don't mean to, to suggest that this is preferable to those. When, when we talked about this a, a couple of months ago, I'm sorry I missed the last meeting. Um, I, 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 I wanted to uh, suggest this model because the ARPA funds were a chance for a, a, a huge investment to, to really get uh, the ball rolling, to really make a dent or start to make a dent in, in uh, this 
you know, the, the problem of, of uh, unaffordable home ownership. Uh, I think the other the other programs are are also worthy of, of funding. Um, and I, I don't and just to suggest or to think that that you could put a that that they you could combine them into into one program doesn't make any sense. We we could easily have submitted three proposals for for this money, and and maybe we should. Um, I didn't I didn't realize that 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 was expected since I had proposed this uh, two months ago. And I also um, another uh, point that I wanted to make is that since the uh, community land trust has has started operations, we have sought funding to um, enter into these uh, partnership arrangements with with home buyers to buy homes. But that has since inspired. Um, residents of Amherst to consider actually donating their homes, donating their homes to the land trust so that they can be used for affordable housing. Uh, our founder um, donated her home upon her death. Um, and so we have, we have one home that is given to the land trust that we, that we hope to make affordable in the near future. And it has inspired um, another, another one that we're working on bringing into uh, the land trust soon. And there's at least three others who have talked about um, and are starting to make steps towards donating their houses. So, so I think um, part of the goal of, of you know, ramping up this program in, in the way that I'm talking about is, is hopefully to um, let people know about this, this model of, of uh, preserving land in Amherst for the purpose of affordable housing so that people can think, oh, maybe I should do that too. Maybe I should consider donating my home or donating um, part of my home or, or uh, uh, making it easier for the land trust to enter into a, a partnership with, with a new home buyer to buy my home at a, at a lower price. And so um, that's, that's a, a you know, I talked about five to eight homes. We hope this leverages more than that. Long-term process. So Rob and I did talk. Um, Rob did the yeoman's work of putting this together and I looked at it. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk to Donna Cabana, but I did look at the Valley Community Development um, Corporation's own proposal. Um, there's was 50,000 times four houses um, in terms of support, but the average that they put out was 234,208 uh, an average home uh, versus um, I think what you shared, uh, John, with us, that listing, which was an average over $300,000 uh, <coughs> for homes here in Amherst, which is closer to what's out there in terms of uh, market. Um, I think the difference also that, you know, Rob and I discussed too, is that um, the Valley Community Development Corps actually has an educational component, which I think is really critical uh, for first time homeowners. Um, but, you know, we don't see this as com competition, but as added value. Um, and I think this is what Rob's talking about is, is that there are other um, uh, entities that are doing first time homeowners. I think what's important is that a first time homeowner knows all the different resources and all of the different options. Um, you know, one of the concerns for me was is that as a first time homeowner, if you have a huge subsidy, it keeps your mortgage low, but if your property taxes go up, you're gonna be taxed out of that property. Um, so, you know, that was one of the things that, you know, Rob talked about, well, if the land belongs to the land trust, then that's not gonna happen. Um, but, you know, those are some of the, you know, the questions that I had. The other piece that I think is different is, is that, um, Valley also proposes the possibility of um, doing condos or multifamilies. Um, if you look at mass housing mortgages where they provide um, assistance, Amherst, I think there's about $15,000 assistance. If you're in large cities, it actually goes up to $25,000. 
Um, and, and you can actually earn up to $157,000, which is a lot of money um, in terms of being a first time homeowner. Um, so, you know, we did look at different options, but I think what's really, really important is that we have options for first time homeowners so they can make a decision about what the best option is for um, him or herself or family. Other comments or questions? Well, when the trust votes, I mean, the recommendation would be for a land trust model of ownership as opposed to like a buy down, right, of the of the asking price, which, you know, is kind of a different type of home, first time home buyer program. So it's really would be the, you know, we could call it like the land trust model. Is that is that accurate? Um, So I just wondered why I think I didn't understand John your comment about the housing trust owning something in this model. It seems like it's the land trust that owns something, right? Not the housing. Yeah, trust. but something in the language that Rob had included the housing trust as a potential uh, partner or owner in this. So that's what. So could you say more about that, Rob, or or Yeah, or Eric I, I, or somebody. I, I guess I. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought, um, I guess I didn't, I don't really understand the, the land trust or the housing trust not being able to acquire property. But I thought, I thought that was part of the purpose of, of it. I just wanted to, to um, su not suggest that it has to be the Amherst Community Land Trust. If there is another oh, okay. stewardship entity out there, whether it's a housing trust or, or some other entity, that's fine. I want the, I want I want the property to 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 become uh, permanently affordable under some stewardship organization. ACLT is is one option. If there's another option, fine. So the issue the issue was separating the home, so the the land would be owned by something the land yeah. trust or the housing trust or da 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 and the house on top of it would be owned by the. Yeah. Okay, I get it. So it's just to open up the possibility so it's not only the community land trust that could do this is your yeah. point. Right. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will say that uh, there are other housing trusts in the state, not many, maybe one or two that have acquired property, um, purchased houses with the land and then done some renovation and then turned it over. And they found they really didn't have the capacity to manage that model. So that's why I, I don't see the housing trust as a manager of a program like this. On the other hand, I did see uh, Valley Community Development having a similar model, not exactly the same because they don't hold uh, stewardship over the land in perpetuity like the community land trust or similarly, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity that has helped to uh, build houses with the future owner. And again, they don't hold on to the property forever. Um, uh, so it's a little bit different model, but given the partnership between ACLT and the other organizations, I kind of thought that <clears throat> we might look to any of them potentially, depending upon who comes up with opportunities for home buyers first to move ahead. John, Linda has her hand raised in the audience. Sure, um, please add Linda to the panel and so we can hear from her, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, just a few things came up as as we were listening as I was listening to comments with respect to the tax burden. Um, we have just enough properties that we've um, we've sorted that out with the and the, our existing property. Uh, it's actually recorded on the property card that the Amherst Community Land Trust owns the land and the named homeowner owns the home, we are a nonprofit. Um, so there's no tax paid on the land. 
And it's further recorded on the property card that the homeowner has entered into a restrictive um, arrangement that caps the resale price at uh, the proportional rise to the area median income over the time of their home ownership. And that similarly prevents their tax burden from rising beyond what's affordable in the status that they entered into the purchase in the first place. So it's only a few cases that we have so far, but uh, the, the assessor's office uh, seems happy with that um, arrangement. And then um, the education, the concern for uh, educating first time home buyers is definitely one that we share. And in our first projects, we've partnered with Valley Community Development as Rob mentioned. So the, our home buyers have the same requirements that Valley CD has for participating in home ownership um, education. And we've also partnered with Habitat. Habitat mostly builds new houses and our original sense of our mission uh, was to preserve family housing that already exists in Amherst in the affordable um, situation. Uh, but our first opportunity was actually to purchase a piece of land and partner that did not have a home on it. And we so our first set of, of homeowners are the ones up in North Amherst I don't know if you noticed Habitat put up a duplex right where the Simple Gifts Farm Market is. That we own that land, that was our first project. Uh, so Habitat is very open to continuing to partner with us with the land trust owning the land. And then the final thing that I'll say about the land trust model um, is that we make every effort to form our residents into a community. Our bylaws require that three, a third of the board be residents of our properties. Uh, and uh, we, we carry out a very modest social program like an annual potluck in the summer, but um, it's definitely part of the intention that people uh, feel part of the community and, and gain uh, leadership opportunities by their participation in managing the trust itself. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, any other comments or questions? Well, then I'm gonna propose we go to a vote. Um, I will move that the proposal that Rob presented is one that we should uh, forward to town hall with our recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Second. Oops. That was quick. <laughs> okay. Uh, are we ready to come to a vote? No further discussion. Okay. Uh, Rob. Yes. I'm a yes. Carol. Yes. Erica. Yes. Allegra. Yes. Sid. Yes. Okay. Then we have. We'll include that and. Um, Rob, was there a recommendation for how much money you thought we should be requesting? Um, yeah, well, so I, I thought I thought um, the town was uh, eligible for $11 million or something in total for, for ARPA. And so I thought, well, why not ask for a million dollars or $2 million for each project? So so I, I put a million dollars on, on the proposal, but you know, any amount, any amount of, from 125000 to $2 million, you know, would help. It would, you know, the more you fund, the more houses you can save. Right. Understood, which is why I suggested that we wanted all of these to be funded so that as future opportunities for additional sources of funding come yeah. down the pike, we've gotten a start on each one. Okay, we'll go on to the third proposal, or actually the fourth proposal. And uh, Carol, you are the trust owner of that proposal? Uh, yes. <laughs> Although <laughs> I, and so who did I talk to? I talked to Laura Baker, who uh, did most of the work, did pretty much all of the work, really. So that's just the truth of the matter. I think it's great. That's my contribution, maybe. 
um, the thing about this is that it that makes it that's different than the other ones that we've been talking about is it actually has the town with the ARPA funds involved in creating additional affordable home ownership opportunities, not just finding a way to, you know, make the one the housing that's already here be more affordable, but actually create create units um, that can be affordable and and partly because of and so there are a couple of uh, there are <clears throat> a couple of possibilities and one of them which we've been talking about a lot is the the land at Strong Street that hopefully can become some kind of uh, home ownership opportunity maybe maybe it would be uh, home smaller homes maybe it would be condos maybe it would be separate houses but it would be home ownership of some sort that the that the town could manage to do kind of like we've done with some of the other things do the maybe the some of the upfront costs would probably be what the ARPA money might be used for and as it turns out there is also another possibility that I really don't know much about but I think Laura does there's some <clears throat> uh, property in North Amherst that might be helped also by having having some funds for some of this upfront stuff um, obviously the development will be undertaken by a developer at the point that we got to that and RFP would go out kind of it seems to me like um, how East Street happened so the town did the town put money in and did a variety of things um, to kind of find do some of the groundwork some of the legwork so that the developer would know things that were necessary to know in order to go forward and come up with a good proposal so uh, that's that's what I got okay um, does Laura have her hand up I can't tell not oh. yet not <laughs> yet okay so so Carol just to clarify I mean are you is this funding recommended for land purchase as opposed to construction costs? So is it like all is it all pre-development costs? If we summarize it that way, so it could be uh, assessment of property acquisition and even um, architectural stuff, but it's not going to be um, actual construction. So it could be any. I believe any yeah, it's not going to. I don't think it's going to be actual construction, both because it would take too much money and because the construction would never be done in time for the money to be used up by the time it has to be anyway. I think those are the two reasons. Um, so it's finding something and being able to get it off the ground, kind of. Yeah, Laura, has, uh, Laura or Carol has three prospective projects that are listed uh, about halfway down into the proposal. Mm -hmm. And I assume all of those are there, at least the first two, so that they could accomplish before uh, 2026, uh, right. at which point the money has to be spent. Right. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think I would categorize this as like affordable housing pre-development money um, in the broad sense uh, for home ownership development. Yes. Yeah, and I'm in support <clears throat> of this. I think if I look at the prospective projects, it would be kind of first come first serve. I would want town to set aside ARPA money for this. And if the Strong Street property became available first, we would use the money for that. If the North Amherst property that Laura's negotiating for came available for, for first, then we'd go to that. Or if some other opportunity came up that would be similar to the first two in some way, then that's what we would want to go to. But in any event, the point is all of these are to support eventual home ownership in town. Yeah, and I, I agree about the first sort of the first come part of the reason for saying the prospective projects here was so this, this isn't some completely pie in the sky thing there really are possibilities and that's important because of the timeline of needing to spend the money so there are some possibilities that this actually could be used for 
even though it doesn't have to be one of these, it would be whatever happens first, like John just said. <clears throat> Questions or comments? Okay, are we ready to come to a vote then? I'm going to make a motion that we also adopt this uh, fourth proposal that Carol has put forward. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Second. Okay. And any questions before we come to a vote? Okay. Uh, then I'll ask people to either vote in favor or against. Uh, Rob? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Carol? Yes. Erica? Yes. Sid? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Okay, and actually there was a price tag associated with this. Am I right, Carol? Um, perhaps. $750,000, was that right? Yes. That's what I recall. Yep, that's right. Okay, so we would pass that along as well. Uh, okay, I think we're pretty much done with these. There's uh, only one other thing I'll ask you, and we don't necessarily have to take a formal vote on this, but I did send you a, uh, a draft note that I would send transmitting this to Sean Mangano. And basically it says we've endorsed all four proposals they're generally consistent with what he had presented to town council, although the title total price tag is higher. And we recommend that all of these be included, uh, again, for the reasons that I suggested earlier, as if we get started on these, as additional state or federal money becomes available, then we're in a better position to compete for those funds as well. Um, any, is there any concern about making that the focus of a letter of transmittal? No, but I just wanna say that it's really interesting that all four proposals are really interlocking in terms of a, a, a multiple prong approach to homelessness and affordable housing. So I think all four together are really strong and should all be supported and all funded. Great, thank you, Erica. Yeah, I think Rob sent a note to me, something similar that all of these are really deserving of support. They're all important initiatives. Okay, well, we've taken a lot of time on this, but I personally expect it to take a lot of time. I think it's worthwhile for all of us to understand it. And uh, I think as, uh, things go along and there's a presentation made to town council, we may want to advocate for these ideas in addition to sending them along to the town finance director. Any other comments or questions? Okay, then I'm gonna move along to the next item on our agenda, which is discussion of the what is it, uh, 2023 CPA proposals, which we've, uh, four of which we've already discussed. The fifth one, uh, Nate and I, or maybe I'll let Nate present it since I've been doing a lot of talking already this evening. And that's the proposal from the Amherst Housing Authority. Sure, yeah, the Amherst Housing Authority couldn't make it tonight. Uh, I'm you know, Nate Malloy, a planner with the town for those in attendance. Um, you know, they're, they have a project that, um, you know, they're requesting about $80,000. It's half the project cost or a little less than product, the half the project cost for uh, residing um, units at John Nutting Apartments. And so they're apartments that are um, off of, um, um, let's say, Cottage Street uh, uh, and um, East Pleasant. 
their the siding is about almost 50 years old so you know they've been maintaining it and now it's become a capital need to replace it and so they're you know they they have this in their their uh, action plan with dhcd so they have to make a request for their a five-year capital plan so this is a project they identified um, and they need to have a, a full budget and so you know, with the money that they're allocated from the state and other sources, they couldn't get a full budget. So they're making requests to CPA to have matching funds. And so it would be a housing project um, to reside units there. Um, you know, we'll say that the CPA committee asked whether this was eligible as a housing project. They thought because it was old enough, it could be a historic preservation project. And they thought that it wasn't quite a capital project at last week's meeting. Um, There's some discussion about it. I think they, I think in the end it was clarified, but if the trust were to recommend this, I think we could reiterate that it's an eligible CPA project and that it's, you know, that the housing authority is leveraging state and their funds with CPA funds to make it happen. So, um, you know, Chad Howard presented to the CPA committee. Um, he works for the housing authority last week. And he said that if it's not funded with CPA funds, they'd probably just sit on it for a year or two and then, you know, either try to get more money from DHCD or come back to CPA. So, you know, they really don't get a large allocation of funding for capital projects for property for their properties. So, you know, they often apply for CPA or block grant money for, for similar projects. Did you say the amount, Nate? I thought it was around $87,000. Is that right? Yeah, you said around 80000 but right, it might be a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Um, which is, I think, a quarter of the cost of the project. I think Something it was like, a, two, like a two, yeah, I guess not quite half. I think it was a $200,000 project. I was, I'm just going to go. I say it maybe it's more like a third then. A third, yeah. Um, I, it, I heard Chad also present this and I thought it made sense to me. Um, it uh, improves not only the siding, but the quality of insulation in the buildings. It makes everything more sustainable. So there are a variety of reasons to support this. It's consistent with other things that CPA funds have been used for in the past. So I see no reason why we shouldn't endorse this. Other questions or comments? Okay, then I'm gonna make a motion that we uh, send a memo to the Community Preservation Act Committee saying that the Housing Trust endorses or recommends this proposal for funding. Um, is there a second? Second. Okay, then we'll come to a vote unless there are other questions or comments before we go forward. I just want to mention it is available on the CPA Committee's web uh, page and for under FY23 proposals and you know, one thing that's nice about this development, it's 18 units, they call it a, like a 669. It's a, you know, it's a federally funded development, but most of the units that are leased up, I think all of them are also, um, you know, connect the residents to services. So yeah, the development just... that, you know, um, is something we've discussed in terms of, you know, it's a difficult thing to connect residents with services. So this development has been doing that and it's permanently affordable. So it's deed restricted to be affordable. Um, so I think, you know, this is just helping preserve the units uh, that's also, you know, just a little background. Yeah, I think in a note I sent out a couple of days ago or Monday, uh, I did provide a link to the proposal. You did. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so I guess we'll come to a vote then. Allegra? Yes. You're looking tired. <laughs> uh, Sid? Yes. Erica? Yes. Carol? Yes. Uh, Rob? Yes. Okay, and I'm a yes, so that passes six to zero. And then we can move on to the four other CPA proposals. Um, I'm gonna dispense with the housing trust ones first. Uh, we asked for $30,000 to continue to get uh, funds for a consultant. Uh, and I think everybody knows who that is and the value of that to us. Um, so that's one of our proposals. Um, I don't know if we have to recommend it. I think the fact that we proposed it is enough of a recommendation. Uh, so I'm not gonna ask for a vote on that one. The, uh, the other 
recommendation was half a million dollars in affordable housing program funds. I want to say a little bit about that right now. Um, when I spoke to the Community Preservation Act Committee, I was obviously aware of the fact, which I wasn't when we proposed this, that uh, the town had asked for half a million dollars for support of a transitional residence. Um, recognizing that the two were kind of in competition with each other, what I told uh, the Community Preservation Act Committee, which was my opinion, is that they should definitely fund at least one of the two. That we needed affordable housing in Amherst and both were reasonable investments. And if they ended up choosing the town investment, I personally wouldn't have a problem with it. I just said, if they intended to do that, then it would be uh, ideal from my point of view if they gave at least $100,000 for the trust to continue to have money to do due diligence for our affordable housing program. The other thing I'll say, which I realized is that um, we're probably never gonna get half a million dollars from the Community Preservation Act Committee for an unspecified affordable housing program. I've asked for the last few years and it seems to me that if they're gonna give that amount of money, they're gonna want it to be for a specific problem project. And moreover, they're gonna wanna bond that project or at least recommend to town council that it be bonded. So honestly, I'm not optimistic they would give us a half a million dollars anyway. So that's my, uh, two cents worth on both of the proposals that we submitted. Any questions or comments before I go on to the town proposals? Is that what they did before? I mean, you asked for $500,000 and they gave some something, but not that much. Isn't that what happened yeah. before? It, yes, yeah. they gave us $200,000, I think, a year ago. Right. Um, but actually, I shouldn't say... We also asked for originally $800,000 to purchase the property at Belchertown Road, but that was a, an ask for a specific project and they ultimately did approve it, uh, recommended to town council that it be, be approved. Town council did approve it and it was approved and bonded. Uh, the ultimate amount wasn't quite $800,000. It was a bit less that was consistent with the actual purchase price of the property was. So uh, that is our experience, Carol. I do think though, you know, I mean, as in years past, but I think I was just going to mention too that this year, there's a lot of large requests of the CPA committee. So there, there's three and a half million dollars requested and they have about 1.2 million available. So there's also a fair number of proposals that came in, um, you know, under, you know, um, under the housing one, there was, um, you know, five in historic preservation, there's, uh, six or seven and in recreation, there's like seven or eight, uh, there was no open space proposals this year. Um, but so, you know, I think the CPA committee in years past, they do allocate almost all of the funding. Um, but usually there's not this many proposals or this much funding requested. So they're really going to have to make a decision this year about what to recommend for funding. Um, you know, they're really going to have to probably not, you know, not fund some proposals just because of the amount of funding asked. Can I ask a question? Sure, Erica. Um, just structurally, aren't we their sort of um, housing arm in terms of implementing housing initiatives, affordable housing initiatives? And because I remember just reading Cambridge's um, uh, proposal in terms of their, their own housing trust, and it was the CPA that provided funding to them. Um, do we not have that link? I thought when we when I read the original document in terms of how we're organized that we are their housing arm and shouldn't we be getting annual amounts? We do not. Um, our uh, strategic nice planning consultant, Jen, uh, I'm blocking on her last name. Goldson. 
yeah, Jen Goldson recommended that that's the relationship that we should have. Um, but CPAC has never accepted that. Um, you're right, Erica. I think both Cambridge and Somerville have that relationship with their Community Preservation Act committee. But this committee prefers to not have a standard allocation to at the housing trust, but to deal with project proposals one by one. And that has not changed since the housing trust came into business or since we presented our strategic plan. And it's not likely to change, honestly. Other questions or comments? Okay, then we'll go on to the town proposal. Um, the town had two proposals. One proposal is for a part-time uh, affordable housing assistant in the planning department to work under Nate's supervision to be funded at, I think, $100,000 over a period of three years. That's my quick summary. Like I say, we did talk about this. Are there questions or comments about that? Okay. Um, are there concerns, any concerns about our recommending or not recommending that proposal? Okay, then I think I'll move on to make a motion that we recommend the town's proposal. Uh, I do make that motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, if there was no second, then we would not move on to voting. <laughs> Okay, uh, then we'll can vote. Uh, Allegra? Yes. Sid? Yes. Uh, Erica? Yes. Carol? Yes. Bob? <clears throat> yes. Okay, and I'm a yes. So that recommendation passes six to zero. And then the second recommendation was and correct me if I get this wrong, Nate, for half a million dollars to support the development of a transitional residence in town. That's um, right, yeah. The, yeah. the proposal did not specify a particular site, but said that the town had, I don't know if the, it even formally said the town had something in mind, either you or Dave may have suggested that, um, but there is no specific site mentioned. It just said the town is working on finding a site. And if a site is found, then obviously having the half a million dollars would be quite helpful. Right. Yeah. So the CPA committee, just to say, you know, like what Erica, what you asked is, you know, about how the trust gets its funding, right? The CPA committee doesn't give the trust an allocation every year. Similarly, it likes to have a specific project. So um, you know, if the town can't name a property in the next few months, it, this, this proposal may, may not be recommended by them. Ironically, the housing trust is named in the CPA statute as one of like two legal entities that can bankroll CPA money without a specific project. So it's almost like in that instance, I'd, ra I'd rather the CPA committee fund uh, the trust proposal. So, you know, to John's point, fund one or the other <laughs> may be a good way to phrase it because you know, um, I think Dave, you know, we discussed putting this in as a CPA uh, request because the money really doesn't become available until next July. And knowing that there's ARPA funding and maybe other state funding available, that it could just be a really opportune time to combine funding to buy a property or something. But there really isn't, um, you know, we don't have any more than that right now. And it may not be enough for CPA committee to recommend it. Granted, like I said, the funding, you know, they're, they started their budget process early. They're going to re recommend this to town council to vote on their budget. Town council may vote on this in March, maybe April, and then the funding is available next July. So we're just trying to you know, plan ahead. On the other hand, if there isn't a specific problem project identified by the time town council votes on it, then there may be no vote. Right. Hmm. Which gets back to your point, Nate. Maybe we're better off asking for 
half a million dollars without an unidentified project because if the town does find a site, then the housing trust could put the money toward that. Or I think, like John said, you said, you said, you know, I like the way you phrased it, recommend one or both, but at least fund one, uh, you know, fully, just so that, you know. But unless I'm missing something, I'd rather have them fund the housing trust because that will stay there even if there's no project. If there's no project and they funded the other one, nobody gets anything. I, I agree in principle, Carol, but I think in practice, <laughs> this particular CPA committee is not likely to fund a project or, or fund uh, half a million dollars without an identified project. Okay. So while I may have suggested that, realistically, I don't think they'd turn to us and say, we'll give you the half a million dollars. How about Erica? this? They fund the town. If the town can't find a place within three months, it goes to us. Uh, again, that goes back. I, I mean, I'm not opposed to that. Don't misunderstand me. I just I know, think John, it's unlikely. I know. You're, you're talking about reality. Yes, right. I just think it's unlikely. Do you, your comment on that, Nate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they wouldn't probably make a condition like that. I think for now, the recommendation might be, I let, you know, like I said, try to fund both, pick one or, you know, recommend both at this point and Maybe the trust has to review this come February just to make another recommendation as it goes to council because um, it just seems really premature sometimes to try to make a decision now. You know, it just seems mm -hmm. really almost too soon to say yes or no to either one of them. But okay, well, I can come back and say what I said. Mm -hmm. It's consistent with what I proposed. That is. Um, they fund at least one, if not both. But also that requires us then as a group to approve the town's proposal for half a million dollars. So I'm gonna make a motion that we approve that proposal. Is there a second? I second it. Uh, I do have a question, Nate, I'm curious if the town does find a property and does receive the CPA funding approved by town council. What would be the role of the trust in that development? Good question. Yeah, we may ask the trust to help with, you know, either facilitating different outreach or even asking the trust for some money for pre-development costs. Um, you know, the trust could also um, help solicit or procure services. So. You know, I don't think that has really been discussed. We just, you know, like I said, we, 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 you know, we thought it was a good time to try to get money to buy a property for um, transitional housing just because of the importance of it. But the logistics of any of that, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I, as far as I know, I haven't been discussed. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Then we'll go to a vote. Um, Erica? Yes. Sid? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Rob? Yes. Carol? Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay, so we have agreed by a vote of six to zero to recommend the town's proposal um, as well. Okay, so we're pretty far along in our agenda. Um, we did a little bit of not much discussion of the draft uh, for the Hickory Ridge. Uh, so there's nothing more, I don't think, to say about that, unless somebody else has something else to add. So uh, the next thing I'll move to is the draft of the survey of older adults, which the town is working on in collaboration with the Council on Aging. And I guess at this point, potentially in collaboration with the Housing Trust as well. Um, this is part of an initiative, and I may have said this uh, at an earlier meeting, for the town to become uh, or work on becoming a dementia-friendly community. Um, and if you read the housing survey, actually, uh, that's not the housing survey, I'm sorry, the survey that they plan to do um, I'm not quite sure who's developed it, but I think it's a standard survey 
that's being used around the state. And in our area, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission has taken responsibility for working with towns to promote the survey. So the survey covers a little over six pages. It includes a range of issues, including housing. And actually, I wasn't necessarily optimistic about what would be in there with respect to housing until I read it. And then I felt, well, they seem to ask all the kinds of questions that at least I personally um, are interested related to uh, looking at the needs of older adults for housing. And so while I'd gone into it kind of thinking we might consider modifying it at some point, um, at this point, I'm perfectly happy with it. I didn't feel the need to add items. Uh, we probably couldn't change items because as I said, it's something that uh, communities around the state are using, but I don't even see a need to add items. So that's my first comment about the survey. Did it, I, I know I sent the detailed survey around. Did anybody else have any questions or concerns about it? I just thought it was amazingly long for a survey <laughs> that you're going to ask old people and it's about dementia. Nobody's going to get through page one, let alone page six or whatever it is. I, me included, and I don't think I quite have dementia, but it just seemed like, I don't know. I thought it was too long. I, mean, I don't know what I'd cut out exactly, but it's like, it takes a lot of stamina to get through it. That's all. And so how many people are going to actually answer it? How many people are going to get to the housing questions? I, yeah, I don't know. And, and I, I still don't know, John, how many um, residents will be asked, you know, if it's going to be uh, mailed directly to them, you know, and if so, how many is it going to be available online? And then, you know, so I think there's, I know there was a few different methods that have been discussed in terms of distribution, but I don't, I, I'm not sure. So maybe part of the trust recommendation or, or, you know, um, to, um, you know, to the staff who are working on this is just, you know, we could, we, like, I think in your email, John, you suggested a certain number, but maybe we just recommend, you know, at least say, you know, if you're doing, you know, at least 500 or, or you know, try to get a certain amount of, send it to a certain number of residents just to ensure a good response. Okay, let, let me go back and uh, say a couple of things about that. First of all, Carol, to go to your point about the length of the survey, I consulted a, uh, someone uh, who has a lot of experience with surveys, my brother. <laughs> and one of his comments was, well, it's too long. He said, you should limit the survey if you're interested in housing just to the housing items. On the other hand, I looked at uh, a study that he sent me and it had, and this was a survey of cancer patients and things about their experiences with their doctors, communication issues. And his survey was actually a page or two longer. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, it wasn't older adults, although some of them may have been older adults for sure that were in his sample. So he did raise with me the issue that it should be sh shorter. The other issue that we talked about more extensively has to do with sampling. Mm -hmm. Yes. The way That's other important. communities have gone about this is to do what is conveniently labeled a convenient sample, which means that you make your best efforts to collect as much information as you can, but doing it in a way that is most convenient. So as an example, you might hand the survey out at the uh, bang center when people come in to pick up meals to take home. Um, you know, people are probably aware that the, there is such a program. Um, similarly, there are a number of residences, some affordable, some not necessarily affordable around town, um, talking about buildings where you know older people live. Uh, that could be like the Amherst Housing Authority facilities that are downtown. So one thing would be to 
put a survey under everybody's door. Um, and they could fill out the survey and turn, bring it back somewhere, or there might also be the instruction, which is actually embedded in the current survey um, that allows you to do one online. So those are examples of things that you could do for a convenience sample. Another thing, Maura Keen said she'd be glad to help. And that occurred to me, well, gee, um, the Amherst Indy could uh, publish the link to the survey online and ask people who are over the age of 55 to go to the link and to fill it out. So all of those are examples of a convenience sample. The advantage of a convenience sample is in general, it doesn't cost you anything to collect the data or it costs you very little. And your goal is to get as much data as you can or um, from as many individuals as possible. Um, but you don't go out systematically to try to uh, collect the data and get what uh, people would call a representative random sample. So the problem with the convenience sample is at the end of the day, after you collect the data, you don't necessarily know what you have. Right. You know who's filled it out, but you don't know who hasn't filled it out. And one concern in that area for me would be people who currently live independently in single family houses in Amherst which is probably the largest number of older adults in town. Those are the people or some of the people whom we're very interested in. We wanna know if they wanna stay in their own homes and there are questions about that in the survey. We wanna know if they see themselves downsizing and wanna to move to affordable housing or whatever. So I have a concern about leaving those people out um, not that I'm uh, not concerned about people who live in existing housing, you know, that's congregate or uh, apartment buildings. I want to be sure that those people are included as well. So um, I haven't talked to the people who would be directly involved yet. And that includes Becky Bash of the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission and uh, Maureen, I'm blocking out her last name. Right, yeah, Maureen Pollock, a planner. Maureen Pollock, right, who's the town planning department. The two of them seem to be the most likely to be take, taking the lead on this, along with the Council on Aging. And I don't know what they intend to do with respect to a convenience sample um, or what we might advise them if we had the opportunity. So what I would like to do, if we can do this and expect a reasonable return at a cost that isn't too high, is to collect data, survey data from a representative random sample of adults, older adults in the Amherst community. Uh, and I'm not absolutely sure how to do that. Um, the most straightforward way to do it, honestly, is a mailed survey. But that assumes that we have a list of all people who are over the age of 55 and live in Amherst. And we may or may not have that. Uh, when I talked to uh, Mary Beth Agulowitz about this back in the summer, she said that she had, did have such a list. And it was drawn from what are the street lists? Everybody here filled out a street list at some point. Voting um, list. Yeah, I mean, there is an the, the, the town clerks is out an annual survey, right? That is asked to be returned. I mean, I think that's the way they collect the data. Oh, right. Yeah, I filled that right. out. Right. That's a street list. Okay. So Carol filled it out. I filled it out. Looks like Eric. Now that filled I know it what out. it is. <laughs> Yes, you filled it out. You may have sent it. Allegra shaking her head. Yes. <laughs> Sid, yes. Probably Rob, yes. So people who are older tend to fill it out. If you're 22 and you're living in rental housing in Amherst, you probably don't. And Nate has told me in the past 
the town doesn't get a great return rate. But I expect it gets a good return rate from people over the age of 55. And that's what constitutes the list that Mary Beth compiled. So I'm guessing that a high percentage of people over the age of 55 are represented on the street list, and we could use it as a sampling frame. So that's what I'd like to be able to do. And if that seems reasonable, what I'd like to do is send out a mailed survey to at least 500 people maybe some more, maybe an additional 500, I'm not quite sure. My guess is it would cost about a dollar and a quarter between printing <coughs> and postage, maybe a dollar fifty um, per survey sent out. Because uh, you'd also have to include a self-addressed stamped envelope inside so the survey could come back that way unless the person elected to do it online. So I'm thinking we could definitely spend $1,000, maybe $2,000 trying to collect data from a representative random sample of residents of Amherst. And if we're gonna spend $2,000, then we as a body need to approve that expenditure for this purpose. So I'll stop there and ask for questions. What makes it random? Or what makes it representative? And what what does that mean when, if we're trying to think about equity and inclusion of people who don't usually get included in things, which is what comes up for me anytime we talk about this stuff. I mean, how, how does that, I don't know exactly what random means or how it's figured out. And I don't really know how it intersects with, with inclusion and making sure that the people who usually don't get asked do get asked. So that's my realm of questions, even though I don't quite even know what my question is. Well, I understand your question and I have two answers. One is yes, there's a way to do it. The second question is, I don't know and can't assure you that people who always, no. who often may not get included will be included. The way to do it is you take the street list and you, uh, uh, make a subset of people over the age of 65. Let's say there are 5,000 people on that list and you want to send out 500 surveys as an example. You would choose every 10th person on the list and send a survey to them. And that makes it a random sample and it makes it a representative sample because you've gone from a list that you think reasonably represents the population of the town of Amherst and chosen your random sample from that. Now, the next question is, well, what about persons of color? Which I assume is what you have in mind when you raise this, Carol. And among people over the age of 55, I don't know what the percentage of persons of color is, but I can tell you that the street list will not tell me who they are. Right. So if I wanted to, be sure of representing persons of color. If the street list had that information, I would oversample those people to be sure that there were a 50 or 100 of them out of the 500. But the street list does not include race, ethnicity. Right. So oh. I have no way of doing that. And since we're not a very segregated town, I also don't have a way of saying, well, uh, as far as I know, will choose certain uh, blocks to sample from that will assure us of including persons of color who are over the age of 55. So the answer to your question, Carol, is yes, I can figure out how to do a representative random sample. On the other hand, I can't figure out unless somebody else has a good idea about how to assure that we get a reasonable number of people, of persons of color, assuming that, you know, 10% of the people over the age of 55 in town are not persons of color. I think most of the people who are, uh, if you look at the census list who are persons of color are probably people who are younger 
because they're mm -hmm. much more substantially represented in the population of university students, both undergraduate and graduate. And Sid shaking his head. <laughs> so I, I think he thinks I'm right. <laughs> and he would know better than I would probably. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's where you'd get it. You know, something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the university doing... does a better job than the town of pulling in people of color. Well, I was going to say one way of doing it is is directing or reaching out to either faith based organizations or organizations that, you know, generally have a relationship with communities of color and asking their population to fill it out that it is 55 plus in those communities. And so um, it may not that, be random, but it might it might help with overseeing. Right. Well, like I said, there are going to be two prongs to collecting data. One is the convenience sample. And there's no reason why we can't propose that to the town for the convenience sample. I just don't know a way to do it for the random sample. Um, so I think we should be doing both. Yeah, I was just looking online. I don't have the street list. I don't know if it asks demographic information. I think the, um, but John, I think what you suggested is, you know, for the trust, I think the the consideration is would we would the trust be willing to spend money to do a, a more in-depth sampling uh you know we'd have to work with the the senior center and pioneer valley planning commission who are who's administering the survey you know they have they have, a, they have their purpose is for an age-friendly community um but i think you know i think it's beneficial you can make the case that it's also beneficial to gather this information for housing purposes as well and so you know we'd be augmenting uh, possibly their service or their survey. And so, you know, I think that's, I, yeah, I mean, if the trust is willing, I think it's a good idea. I think, John, that you and I could work with Maureen and Becky, and I think um, there's probably a few other staff and see, how, you know, how they would want to go about it. Yeah. Okay, further questions or discussion? Well, I'm going to move that the trust allocate uh, up to $2,000 for purposes of um, collecting data from a representative random sample of older adults. Um, I think it will help the town's general interest in this, as well as the housing trust interest in knowing more about the housing needs of the over 55 population. So is there a second to my motion? I'll second it. Okay, then since it's late, we'll come to a vote. Uh, Rob? Yes. Uh, I may yes. Carol? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Sid? Yes. And uh, Erica. Erica? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'm getting tired too. Okay, I think that's the last piece of business we'll try to do tonight. There are other pieces of business that will um put off till our december meeting uh we may want to put some time in at that point in discussing uh the university's role in town housing in town given the uh the um newspaper article that nate circulated to us earlier any other last minute comments I was going to say just two quick updates. You know, we have a contract going for the Strong Street assessment. Oh, great! Thank you. Yay. Yeah, I'm hoping they get the consultants seem eager to get out there. But um, their Levesque Associates, they do. You know, they the proposal is for them to do a wetland delineation on the entire property, and then do a concept development on the um, on it uh, with utilities, and then also do soil borings on areas where they think there could be development, just to determine if there's any, you know, what type of what type of soil there is. Um, they did find a survey at the Registry of Deeds that they felt was accurate, so that they don't have to survey the property. Um, so that's good news. Um, the other one is the the uh, proposals for the Belchertown Road East Street School request for proposals are due November nineteenth. Um, we did have a number of questions asked. It seems like you know, a few developers are serious about it. So I'm hoping we'll have at least two responses. Um, and it may be that, you know, one or two members of the trust is asked to be on the review committee. Um, so, you know, just putting it out there, if there's someone who's really interested in that, 
um, you know, you could let John or I know. I mean, my thought is John would be on the review committee, <laughs> but there may, you know, if there's anyone else who is, the idea is we adopt to review the proposals. There's a bunch of, you know, comparative criteria that we had. It also would involve interviews and possible, you know, a second round of, of meetings with the, with the proposers. But I'm hoping that at the next meeting, we can report that we have some proposals to review. So I'm Great. Ready. Thank you, Nate. I'd forgotten that. And thanks okay. for the update on Strong Street. Um, is there anybody right now while we're sitting here who would like to be part of the review process? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks, Carol. I'll, I'll, I'll also jump in. Sorry? I said me too. I'll, I'll jump okay. in. Great. Thank said Thank you. Okay. Well, um, we'll do our best to get at least uh, one or two other people as part of that process. Mm -hmm. So thanks everybody. I'm sorry the meeting has run a little bit over. I appreciate everybody's participation. I think it's been a very effective meeting. I, Thank you all. Somebody uh, has their hand up, I just noticed. Yeah, we... Nina, uh, and oh. you, can, you can unmute yourself. Um, yeah, Nina, Nina Wild. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's pretty exciting all the proposals that you guys are working with. I'm, I'm learning about them. This is wonderful. And I just had one thought this had to do with the first proposal you spoke about, which is the either the permanent um, shelter or the transitional shelter. And I mean, I, I really, it just the, the idea popped into my mind and it's kind of stuck there. And I was just wondering about our survival center. And um, I think it has a commercial kitchen, doesn't it? They serve meals. Yes, it does. And they have wonderful services and a beautiful new building. And I don't know, I just suddenly thought maybe there's some way to expand their campus to include some overnight housing that could be flexible for future use in another way or... Anyway, I just thought maybe it might be something that could be um, expanded, worked it's with. an interesting idea, Nina. I suspect you should talk to Lev or their board about that to see if their interest, is their interest there, and then it could be pursued. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I okay. will say when, you know, they are, they are actually having shelter guests go to the survival center for this season for showering and laundry and maybe for a meal. Um, when they did expand and build the new, uh, at the new location, the town asked if they would be willing to accept or have, you know, um, transitional housing there. And they said, you know, their focus really is on food security and that housing is just such another, you know, such a complex piece in addition to it. They just didn't, you know, at the time, they weren't looking to have both of those kind of programs being run um, because it is, you know, a much different thing to have, you know, tenant management or property management, but, um, you know, it is something that I guess could be brought up again. Yeah, it's almost a decade ago. Right. New executive director, new board. Maybe there have been changes. She's a decade ago. John, I remember that. It seems like it was just, <laughs> it was just, just, just the other day. <laughs> right. Wasn't Mindy Dom the executive director then? Uh, actually, no. When the no. building uh, occurred, it was uh, before that. Cheryl. Cheryl. Uh, what's Cheryl's last name? I mean, she's the, yeah, she's the executive director of uh, uh, the equivalent of Planned Parenthood. I can't remember. I'm sorry, it's too late. Oh, Cheryl's all tapestry. Yeah, Cheryl's all, Thank yes. you, Cheryl's all right. Oh, uh, tapestries. Yeah. Tapestry, exactly. Tapestry. Uh, Thank yep. you. Yep, and it was. And I'm sorry, Representative Mindy Dom. <laughs> or Rep Dom, <laughs> as people refer to her. <laughs> Okay, well, thanks everyone. And uh, again, I appreciate everybody.